We like taking responsibility for things we do, and sometimes for things we don't do and are not responsible for. Two days before they arrived in India, Esther and uh, Abhijit won the Goldman Sachs Financial Times Award for Business uh, Book of the Year for this book. And uh, all of us at the Health Club were congratulating ourselves as if we were somehow responsible. Uh, we weren't. Congratulations on the award. Uh, es <laughs> Esther and Abhijit are at MIT where they run the Poverty Action Lab. And they are really forensic scientists studying causes symptoms and consequences of poverty through randomized control trials across the developing world. Uh, they've arrived at some very lucid and startling conclusions in this book on a variety of issues from healthcare to housing to uh, education. And we're here, of course, to talk about education specifically in the context of India. Uh, let me start with Esther. Uh, Indians are very proud of the fact that they'll have the largest working age population in the first half of the 21st century, what some people call our demographic dividend. Does the state of our schools uh, threaten that dividend? Yes, definitely. Uh, the demographic dividend will turn into a demographic liability unless the schools can churn out people who are not only young, but also are qualified and educated. I think there are two reasons. One is the traditional one. Unless you have an educated workforce, and of course, they are not able to take advantage of any of the great possibilities that Sam was just talking about. The second one, I think we just saw an illustration very recently, is that I don't know what is worse, whether it's having never gone to school or whether it's having gone to school and having gotten very little out of it. The, the Arab Spring was started or was ignited by a young man who decided to set himself ablaze. That young man was not uneducated. He had gone to school. He had gone to school for a very long time. He had no job to show for it. Part of the reason is the state of the labor market, but part of the reason is the state of education that you receive. And I was Tunisia. And frankly, unfortunately, the state of school is probably a bit worse here. Many parents have now bought in education. They understand they need to send their kids to school, and they do. The enrollment rates in primary school is over 95% in most states in India. But the problem is the kids go in school, they go in school, they go in school. At the end of grade five, they've usually learned very little. The ASER survey that Pratam has been running since 2005 showed in 2005 that about half the kids who, had, uh, who were in, enrolled in school from grade two to five could read a grade one sentence or a grade one paragraph. That's 2005. But in 2006, 2007, 2008, 2009, 2010, it had not improved. So I think this is a real, real challenge that you have to confront. Obviously, to take off from where she concluded, uh, in your book, you make this distinction between enrollment and learning. Merely showing up at school or merely getting children to go to school doesn't mean they're actually learning something. And you say that policymakers focus on access, getting children to school, but not so much on whether they're learning anything or, or the methodology of teaching, really. And uh, do you think Indian policymakers, such as those behind the Right to Education Act, who've been focusing on school access, getting children to school, also fall into that trap? I learned from Arvind Kejriwal yesterday that one does, shouldn't necessarily be too shy in expressing one's views. So, <laughs> <laughs> so the answer is yes. I, I, I think the, the right to education is what someone, a, a, a very sympathetic elite sitting in Delhi thinks of how to help the poor uh, children get educated. It's, and it has, it's, often it seems to me entirely unhinged from the reality of poor parents and, uh, and the challenges they face. I mean, it's a, it's a, it, it, it's a I mean, I think the, at the core of, core of the bill is this idea that, which I think a lot of middle class, upper middle class parents are obviously obsessed by, the key there is to get your child into a school. The school should have a good playing field so that you know, they, they get some extracurricular activities and they, sh they should have teachers who have a good degree and uh, are paid enough and they should have uh, whatever toilets for girls and toilets for boys. The whole bill reads like a catalog, a building catalog. 
you know, and uh, in, and it's sort of it's very hard to read through the right to education and other than by sort of accident encounter the thought that you know how do how how shall we promote learning? Indeed, uh, I would say it's go. Uh, it's not that it is is it's against learning, obviously not. But in some ways, uh, the core, some of the core themes in it are sort of exactly I would say. Um, exactly inimical to the uh, to how you get children to learn i mean it, well, i think one of the things that I, I most bothers me is is the idea that if this law is actually implemented um, many 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 schools cut rate private schools that run uh, I, i've seen many 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 of them all over india the, every village has four five six cut rate public school, these schools are run in somebody's house, they certainly do not have a, a playing field, they do not even have a, a proper classroom. Then nonetheless, there are places where there are you know the, te the teachers are relatively enthusiastic, the, te you know, the, the children seem much more engaged. Uh, there is a whole set of these schools, all of them and also a whole set of schools run by NGOs, all of them will fall directly afoul of the right to education and unless something is done to change that, they are going to all have to shut down and then all those children will be herded back into these government schools where the, there is a playing field, there are classrooms, there are sometimes to separate toilets for boys and girls, but there are often no teachers. That is the missing teacher is a very important narrative in this book. And uh, one of the reasons children are not learning, Esther and Vichit argue, is because uh, teachers are often absent. In fact, India has one of the world's highest teacher absence uh, ratios. A teacher in a government school in India, they find, misses more than one day out of five in school. It is amongst the highest ratios in the world along with, I think, Uganda. And there is one paragraph I would like to quote here. The evidence from India suggests that even when teachers are in school and are supposed to be in class, they are often found drinking tea, reading the newspaper or talking to a colleague. Overall, 50% of teachers in Indian public schools are not in front of a class at a time they should be. How are the children supposed to learn? How indeed, Esther, and why are these teachers missing? Are they overburdened? Are they bored? Are they underpaid? I think they are neither overburdened nor underpaid. Uh, they might be bored. I think they, they are often at a loss. I think it's very easy when you see statistics like that, like one day in two, the teacher is either not present or is not doing uh, any teaching duty to conclude that oh, the teacher is a culprit, the teacher is a political appointee, the teacher has no interest in the children. But the truth is that a lot of people here, like anywhere else, go into the teaching profession with uh, the desire to do something. And then something happened to them somewhere along the way that leads to this complete loss of, of morale, which is manifested both by this high absence rate and also by the fact that if and when they teach, they teach in a somewhat desultory way. And I don't think that's their carelessness. I think it's often the fact that the way their mission is defined is not particularly clear or not particularly productive. And by that, I'm not saying that they are overburdened by conducting the census. I think that's a smoke screen. I think they are overburdened because they are told you are, your objective is to bring all of the children you have in front of you to teach them this completely insane curriculum <laughs> that involves uh, like piles and piles and piles of books that the kids can't even carry on their back. And you have to start that from grade one, and you have to bring the kids until grade 12. And they know they can't do it. They know they can't do it for most of the kids. Maybe for teachers in, in, in rural India somewhere, they know they won't get the vast majority of the children they have to grade 12. So their job is kind of finished before it's even started. And I think that's extremely despairing for them. That's very despairing for the, for the students as well. And that's maybe the core fundamental scene in the system. If I could ask a subsidiary question, Esther, one of the findings in their book is that the same teachers who uh, were not very good in 
in school, when they were brought in for extra classes or for summer school, where there was no pressure on finishing a syllabus or a curriculum, actually perform better? Right. So I just said earlier that children aren't, so many children go to school for five years, and at the end of five years, they can't read. That's a bit of a disaster, right? So you might think, well, maybe it's very, very difficult to, to teach a child to, to read. But the fact is, it's not true. Uh, there are NGOs, there are programs like uh, Pratam and many others who are able to uh, take a kid who couldn't read in a very short amount of time, I'm talking about two, three months, get these kids to a level where they can actually read. And one of the big puzzles, one thing that has puzzled us is why aren't those things done? Why is it possible to do it out of school in this camps, remedial camps for a few months, and it's done, not done in school. So we tried with Pratam, with the government in various places to train the teachers and couldn't really get much leverage when we tried to get them to do that during the school year. Okay. But instead, if you teach them to do that and you give them some time during the summer to do it during summer camps, they are, A, they are willing to come back, B, they are not absent during the summer camp. C, they are actually teaching in a way that at the end of the summer camp, there are tremendous gains for the kids who have actually attended those camps. That shows a teacher can do it. The big, big difference is this mission. In the summer camp, it was clear, you take these kids who can't read, you teach them to read. You don't teach them nuclear physics, not yet. <laughs> you teach them to read, and you can do it, and they can do it. And when you do that, because it happens to be true, the teachers can do it, the students can do it, then they do it. Uh, Abhijit, following from that, learning is a dynamic process. You learn what your teacher teaches you. You also learn, in a sense, what you want to learn and what your parents want you to learn. Now, parents such as the ones in this room take a knowledge of English for their children for granted, so the child can learn anything from mathematics to pottery. Uh, but for the vast majority of Indians, English becomes this game changer. We, I somehow have to know English, and I must send my child to any, any old school. You, there's a line in your book, expectations about what education is supposed to deliver distort what parents demand of schools. Is this true, really, for this thirst for English? Because I have, like, people who work with me at, in, in Delhi, they send their son to any old English school, irrespective of what else is being taught there. It's definitely, uh, I mean, it's definitely true that uh, there is an enormous thirst for English. I have a hard time, uh, I think the evidence I've seen is very mixed on whether that's per se a good thing or a bad thing. I think the more general point that we were trying to make there was, I, 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 do, I would stand by, which is that I think parents have very clear notion of what education is, and that notion is in some ways also central to the dysfunctionalities of the educational system. It's sort of, the parents seem to act, and I, I, do, I think it's one of the things that you will notice if you go to a, a, a sort of village and you talk about education, uh, parents will often, um, often um, do something which I don't think any parent in this room will, will which is they'll sort of, have, there are two children standing here, and they'll say, oh, he, He's really not, he, he's a buddhu. He, he can't really manage a school. So we're sending him to government school. And, well, whereas, and then sometimes it's even the girl. Uh, she's really smart. We're sending her to a private school, she's learning English. And I think the more general notion that I think is very much there is the idea that parents very early decide that the goal of education is to get, get through to class 12 and get a job. Uh, I think if you look at all the evidence from the world, it's any bit of bits or pieces that you learn along the way, all of them deliver value actually. Actually you learn from many things. You don't just learn from, from um, you know, getting through the class 12 exam. Even if you got to eighth grade, your earnings are about you know, 50% higher than if you didn't get to uh, eighth grade over your lifetime, which is a huge gain. So it's, it is, it's somehow the pair of parents and the entire system seems to be discounting the benefits of learning a little, 
and focusing on, you know, if my child could only learn English and speak English fluently, then there will be gains. Not that, you know, even if he could learn a few words of English, he could learn a little bit of math, there would be gains there. So I think there is a general kind of winner take all mentality in how people think about education, which then builds on itself because most kids of course can't get there given their background, given the teaching ever available. So then they give up very fast. Everybody in the system gives up on children very, very early because they feel that you know, since the goal is to get to class 12, get to learn English, you'll be able to write and read in English, that's not going to happen. And since it's not going to happen, it's kind of over. The story is over for most children uh, on day two. Uh, uh, this is fascinating story they tell in their book about identity and education. In a randomized experiment, they gave two sets of uh, evaluators uh, answer sheets, I presume, of children with cast names and answer sheets of children without cast names, with only the first name. And in, in the answer sheets with no cast names, the children did reasonably similarly to each other. When you had answer sheets with caste names, the children from the so-called lower caste consistently did worse than the children from the so-called upper caste. Sometimes, even the so-called lower caste evaluators gave the so-called lower caste children lower marks. And this is completely fascinating because uh, to what degree does identity, family background, and who we are determine what we learn? Esther, would you like to take that? I think uh, I wish just talked about the importance of expectation, the fact that parents and teachers, I spoke about teachers, I spoke about parents, mm -hmm. they think that it's very important that the kid manages to get to grade 12. Now, that means that it's very important what they believe, what their children can do. And likewise, teachers must believe in the children, the children must believe in themselves, and the parents must believe in the children. So if everybody believed in this way, in some sense, I would be self-reinforcing and I would be great. The problem is that for a lot of poor kids or a lot of low caste kids, it's exactly the opposite, which is this, I, this idea that you need to get to the top is compounded by the idea that not only that, but you know what? You can't. And what happens is that the kids themselves, if you make them do simple uh, acuities, like say, solving mazes, you just ask them to solve mazes, and they solve their mazes, and the low-caste kids do just as well as the high-caste kids, because it has not much to do with background, your ability to solve a maze. If you do the same game, but first you say, hi, you are so-and-so, which reveals the full cast name of the child, and reveals to the child that the examiner know the full, knows the full cast name of the child, then the low-caste children do much worse. Another one is that have students write essays, have, them, have teachers grade the essays with or without the name of the child. And again, if the name of the child is there, the teachers give lower marks to the lower caste children than if they are not there. Now, what is really tragic is who does that? It's not the upper caste teachers who are discriminating against lower caste students. It's the lower caste teachers who are themselves so convinced and so have so much bought in and into the idea that these kids can't do it, that they actually mark them lower. Probably not out of meanness, but out of being convinced. So what is happening is that everybody is convinced that the child can't do it. The child gets convinced themselves that they can't do it. And therefore, as a result, they can't do it. Because if no one has the enthusiasm, the energy, and the faith in a particular child, what is the child going to do? So if I could take a supplementary question, if I could ask you to tell the story of where identity does not matter. Your example from Israel, between, uh, and the comparison between uh, uh, Jewish children who migrated from Ethiopia and Jewish children who migrated from Russia. Why didn't you tell us that story? So of course, one could say, well, but identity does matter because these lower caste children after all, it's true that statistically their children might, their teachers, their, their parents may not be able to read themselves. They might be first generation learner. That's much harder for them to learn. So of course they're not going to go as far. But the truth is that that's really not putting enough belief in, in how much a school can do. Uh, this experiment you're talking about is like, this is 
uh, uh, in, is, in Israel, uh, uh, many, many Jews from Ethiopia were airlifted on one single day with their children, like saved from Ethiopia where something was happening. And then they were scattered around uh, schools uh, all over the country, and they started studying the schools. Their background was much, much, much different than that of the other Israelis or the, the children of uh, Russian parents who themselves had come from Russia with PhDs and things like that. So they start at a much lower level. By the end of, junior, of secondary school, they have almost caught up. That shows that a school that is run with the idea of making the kids succeed can make the kids succeed. Enormous amount of things are happening in the schools or could be happening in the schools if the schools are determined to get it right. So these obsessions that we have with the background, it's just, and the obsession that the entire, that everybody has with the background is self-defeating and, and wrong. Okay. Uh, Abhijit, we were discussing testing yesterday, and you actually support testing. A lot of people in India feel that testing is sort of harmful for the child, is insensitive, and class 10 tests have been abolished. And in fact, children can be promoted every year right till class 12, or class 10, I believe, without, thank you, that's the first bell, right? Yeah. Uh, without a test. Uh, but you say that this is an old-fashioned idea which went out of the window many years ago in the US, and actually testing is good. Well, it's, testing does three things, and one of which I, uh, I'm, uh, I think is the one that people who frame this policy, again, uh, I, I think if this is the instinct of the, uh, of, of, of the um, elites uh, uh, who are out to do good, uh, is, is, um, is that it, they can be punitive, they can be used against the child. And I think that there is a lot, lot to that and we need to be careful about that. There are two other things testing does. One is, is it, that it helps people assess schools. And I think one of the things that's very frightening to me is the idea that you know, parents, semi-literate parents have to choose basically pri between private and government schools or between one private school and another private school and there's no guidance available. So one of the things that in, in the US is done quite carefully is to, distinguish, is to have testing of children, sort of compulsory testing of children, but te compulsory testing with only the school level scores are, are revealed. So you don't necessarily have to use the scores punitively against the children, it's just you find out which school is teaching well and which school isn't. And without that kind of testing, some kind of a reliable public exam, where you can, so Massachusetts, where I live, has a fourth grade and an eighth grade exam which every child has to take. That doesn't mean every child gets his score back. It means the school is, you know, you see which schools are completely not delivering education. How is a parent supposed to know uh, which schools are teaching well if there are no exams that are objectively given by some outsider? Second problem, I think, is just that this is just, a, you know, given how, how innovative we are in, as Indians, what will happen if you abolish class 10 testing is that you know, parents still want to know what their children are good at and what their children are bad at, and they don't trust the schools. So a whole, there'll be a mushrooming of tests. I, I predict this, we'll see in a couple of years. Mushrooming of tests, the kind of the SAT equivalents where children will take all kinds of tests to signal to colleges, signal to, uh, signal to you know, better schools that they are do, doing well. And those tests will be expensive and the poor will be excluded from it. So in some ways, giving people some indication of how well they are doing is not, not necessarily, it doesn't have to be punitive. There is, the right to education doesn't exclude that, but it has this idea of continuous evaluation. We're working with the Haryana government to kind of work on what continuous evaluation means, except that I think right now, that's a good, it's a long way from getting that idea absorbed in the teaching system. So I think continuous evaluation right now means no evaluation. So eventually, maybe we'll solve that problem. But in the meanwhile, there'll be a whole cohort of people who'll get no guidance to how well they're doing uh, just because out of the goodness of the, our heart, we've decided to liberate them from testing. Uh, but they're not liberated from the, the economic system. They're not educated from the parents' expectations. So I think this is not going to exactly help them. Uh, Abhijit, if I could squeeze in one small question. You talk in the book about picking a winner. A family has five children and says, we will put all our money on this one child. How does a family pick a winner? Is it a form of Darwinism? Is it a form of uh, 
testing, informal testing. It's an interesting subject. Lots of people have been looking at it and one of the things I just saw a study from Burkina Faso where they actually look at the child's kind of their, their um, kind of an IQ uh, measure, um, however dubious that might be. And they find that parents are actually not bad at picking the child with the uh, highest IQ measure to put their money on. So, the, but the, the core fact that you mentioned is really interesting which is that parents are making these choices somehow based on the performance of the child in first or second grade, deciding this child I'm going to put my money on, all the other children are basically not going to get an education. That's sort of, I mean think of what, ha what, what happens to a child when at grade two he's told by his parent, tum to buddhu ho. So you're written off at that point. I, I think that, that brutality that I think the whole education system with its sort of top heavy emphasis on its emphasis on you know you have your buddhu unless you can read a whole textbook in class two. Uh, that just idea I think is I think there is a certain amount of just base cruelty in, in the way the education system is now framed. Fine. Thank you so much uh, Esther and Abhijit for a enthralling and engrossing conversation and looking forward to your next book.